In 1990, the film world was abuzz with the live-action adaptation of the popular Dick Tracy comic. It had numerous big-name stars behind the project, including the likes of Warren Beatty, Madonna, Al Pacino, and Dustin Hoffman. It released that summer and had a massive advertising campaign behind it. Sega of America felt this IP had loads of potential, so they secured the rights to produce a game based on it for their consoles. The thing is, they had no one to actually develop it. This was 1990 and Sega's American branch still lacked a fully loaded development team to create software. Sega Technical Institute was in its infancy at this point and only really consisted of two members, one of which was the guy running it, Mark Cerny. Scott Chandler was hired to help Cerny with programming, Alan Ackerman was brought on to handle background art, Takashi Doi was behind the animation, and finally Takoyuki Nakamura handled the music. Sega gave this group a mere five months to get the project finished and released. That happened in February of 1991, a Genesis version that came on a 4 megabit cartridge and was the very first product created by Sega Technical Institute. Just how did this game turn out, and is it worth playing today? Let's find out. Contrary to what you may think, Sega did not base the Genesis version directly on the movie for its story. It's still set in the 1930s, but it's instead a simple tale of a city being overrun by gangsters and your job is to stop Big Boy, who plans to make explosives in a secret location. Yep, that's it. Not much to it really, but it drives the narrative as you track down the thugs needed to find the factory and ultimately the main bad guy. There are six stages that are each broken down into three scenes. The final scene for each stage is a boss fight. Scenes 1 and 2 are essentially a mix of run and gun and beat em up action. Sometimes you will be on foot gunning down enemies on two planes. There are the enemies on your plane, where you fight with your fist and a handgun, and then there are the background enemies that can be mowed down with your machine gun. Other times you are punching your way through bad guys on a single plane. There are also a few vehicle based scenes where you are hanging off the side of a police car battling enemies both in the background and in the foreground. During all of this, Dick Tracy has the ability to duck and jump, giving you the mobility to avoid most forms of damage. You'll still need to be careful because Tracy only has a limited number of life blocks down there in the bottom left of the screen. There is also a time limit to be aware of, but it's rarely an issue until the later boss fights. Finally, a bonus stage presents itself after each stage completion. Blast the bad guys and avoid the good guys to earn extra score and credits. Be sure to make the most of these early bonus stages, because the later ones are so difficult, it's easy to earn nothing at all. Dick Tracy was a good looking Genesis game, particularly for one released in 1991 and using just 4 megabits. The color and animation are the standouts here, easily matching or besting other games at that time. The backgrounds are a tad simple and it's a shame more parallax wasn't used to give the areas a bit more pizzazz, but overall you can't hate on much here. I was especially impressed with the damage your bullets cause to the windows, cars and doors in the environment. While the story itself didn't really follow the film in any meaningful way, the character designs do. Dick Tracy has his bright yellow trench coat, hat, and is clearly modeled after the star of the film, while many of the boss characters follow their movie designs as well. The 1930s era is mostly captured here in the clothing, cars, and newspapers of the time. It lends the design a bit of a unique look that makes the setting feel old, but not quite ancient. The one area of complaint I have is mainly the reuse of assets. There are numerous stages here that look exactly the same aside from the layout. You'll find yourself on very similar city streets and warehouses for much of the middle game, 
before the final stages give you something new to look at. This samey design extends to many of the boss encounters as well. Reused assets are the order of the day, and you'll see these stages a few times before the end. This issue is also present for the enemies, who are all just wearing different colored suits, yet are identical otherwise. It looks good and that animation is quite eye-catching, but it needed more variety and a few extra layers of parallax scrolling to compete with the big boys. The soundtrack to Dick Tracy is low-key and lacks any real punch at all. It's not terrible to be sure, but it also doesn't really elevate the experience either. Much of the music is also reused for multiple stages. This was extremely disappointing because composer Takayuki Nakamura also worked on the likes of eSWAT, Moonwalker, Outrunners, and the first three Virtua Fighter games. This dude had the skill to bring us something much more powerful. Here are a few examples to see what I mean. Dick Tracy is one of those games I wanted to love so much back then. I mean, when you look at its core gameplay design, it's very similar to other Sega releases like eSWAT City Under Siege, which I adored. And there is much here to admire. I really enjoyed the mechanic of shooting enemies in the background. The animation was impressive. The color was bright and lively. There certainly was enough challenge, and it never felt boring. But there are also some elements here that hold it back from its full potential. The previously mentioned repeating of graphical assets and music, the lack of any meaningful story or ending, and you'll get sick of those bullet sponge boss fights that are loaded with ridiculous amounts of invincible frames pretty damn quick. And while we're on the subject of cheapness, much of the late game gets pretty bad. Enemies pop out of nowhere and use moves you can't. Some can roll and some can even go prone requiring you to bump the enemy to knock him out of this. I really dislike games where enemies have such simple actions that you can't do yourself. This is so incredibly lame and a poor way to increase difficulty. I also think Sega made a mistake confining this one to just 4 megabits, and further made the error of not giving Sega Technical Institute a few more months to add some more oomph to the story and presentation. I mean the fact is that Dick Tracy for the Genesis had already missed the theatrical release, it missed the home video release, and it even missed Christmas of 1990, so a 1991 release pushed to April or June should have been an option. A few more months could have given Cerny and his team a bit more time to polish this with a few more gameplay and visual elements to really improve the experience but don't let any of that spoil you on a game that I feel is still fairly solid. It won't win any awards for the best game on the platform, but it's far from the cellar dweller most movie-based tie-ins were. If you enjoyed the game design of many of Sega's early Genesis titles, what's here will no doubt keep you glued until you finish it. Just be sure to practice those early bonus stages so you'll have enough continues to see the end.
Unfortunately for the Sega Technical Institute, Dick Tracy did not sell well on the Genesis. It came and went pretty quickly, and I don't think Sega even bothered to do a second run. I do think its legacy is pretty important for Sega, however. Aside from being Sega Technical Institute's first game, it's also a true exclusive. This version has never been ported, reissued, or included in any classic collections. The only place you can play it is right here on the Sega Genesis. For you Master System fans, Sega also made a version for that console. It's largely similar to what was on the Genesis, though it's been heavily cut back in terms of presentation. Reviews for the 16-bit release were all over the place back then. You had some publications like Mega in the UK pretty much hate on it as a terrible experience, not worth your time. Electronic Gaming Monthly was in the middle, offering the view that it was just okay. And the popular French magazine Joystick absolutely loved it, rating it among the highest games that year. I would imagine that today's audience will be similarly split down the middle. Many will find it repetitive and the IP lacking a modern appeal while others will dig the early 16-bit vibe and the simple-to-learn arcade-inspired gameplay. I'm on the fence on this one. Part of me falls into both camps, so I'm gonna recommend you give this one a go. I think there is a lot here to enjoy if you can look past its shortcomings. There is a fun game here, and you can only play it on the Sega Genesis. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.